Hello and welcome to Communication Disorders 221 Intro to Communication Disorders. This is the first class or the first lecture in the in the course and it is intended to augment and to explain um, the chapter, the assigned chapter, which is Gilam 2016, which is the third edition. And the credit is given to the to the um, the publisher, as you see below, uh, the copyrights or the slides which the publisher provides. I provide um, minimal um, modifications, and then the next, uh, you know, these uh, next uh, classes, there will be some some other modifications by adding some pictures and things. But we try to keep the content as much as possible. Uh, consistent with the assigned chapters. So, my name is Dr. Ahmed Abdelal from Bridgewater State University, and this is recorded for students in my class uh, who are taking the online communication disorders course. So, in the um, in this lecture, we are going to speak about the um, the fields of speech language pathology and audiology. Uh, we are going to speak about um, the disorders of communication, including um, hearing uh, and also communication reception of la receptive language, expressive language, uh, speech um, disorders. Uh, and also, uh, we'll differentiate among um, specific concepts that pertain to the course like uh, the concept of impairment, what is an impairment versus a disability versus a handicap versus a disorder, a difference, a delay, and so on. And, and the last part is going to focus more on the roles of the speech language pathologist and the audiologist and the speech hearing scientist and their job, um, for example, where they work, job settings, and, and information about accreditation, uh, certification, and licensure. So, generally, um, human beings are made to live in societies. They are social beings, and they live, have an interdependent relationship with other members of the society or the community they live in. Um, in terms of communication, communication is used as a tool to express the individual's feelings, needs, whatever way, you know, things that the, that individual needs to convey to members of the community so that they can get the social benefits of being included in the community, um, the social benefits of getting, you know, things to sustain their lives from the community, like having a dentist, having a physician, having a baker, having someone to clean your home, having someone to groom your, you know, pets, all kinds of things that we depend on other people to, you know, and, and other people also in the community will in, depend on us for playing a role to help them in one way or another. So when you look at uh, communication this way, it is a two-way street. As a communicator in a community, I have to be able to understand what other people tell me, the messages they tell me, but whatever they want to, to tell me. I have to I have the ability to understand. And I also, in the meantime, I have to have the ability to express to them and to convey to them my ideas, my feelings, my emotions, and so on. So when you look at hearing, for example, um, you, in order to comprehend messages, you have to hear what others say, for example. And in order to, to develop language, you cannot develop language like spoken language. You can never develop it if you do not have intact hearing. And for example, people who are born without uh, functional hearing, who are born deaf, completely deaf, they will not have a chance to develop verbal language unless they have cochlear implants. Uh, they will will learn sign language if, given that they have the 
intellectual abilities and, and intact brain mechanisms to enable them to acquire language. They can be so proficient in sign language, they can be inventors, scientists, anything that you, anyone else can be. But spoken language, in order for you to develop it, you must have functional hearing. So because through the functional hearing, you internalize the rules of the language, the sounds and the differences among sounds and so on. And these sounds and words and, and sentence formats, or we call it grammar, these become the templates that someone uses in order to understand messages that come to them by hear, when they hear them. And they will be templates so that they can send these templates to the motor system that moves your muscles of the, your facial muscles, the muscles of the organs inside of your mouth, like the tongue the muscles of the neck, you know, the lar laryngeal muscles, and so on, or the muscles of breathing. All of these muscles have to be coordinated together so that once you have the template, you can send the command down and you make all these muscles work together to express what is here already. But if you don't have it here, you will not be, you have nothing to convey. Uh, the same way, you cannot develop um, speech uh, without having hearing. Now, you see the arrow is pointing backwards and forwards. So now, if you do not hear speech, there is no way you can develop, you know, the, the mechanisms in your brain that will teach you how to speak. If you don't have, if you don't hear language, there is, you can have the best brain ever. But if you don't hear language, if you do not hear speech consistently and frequently and constantly as you are developing, there will be no chance for you to acquire language. So acquisition of communication of language, spoken language, uh, and the ability to comprehend language, it requires, number one, that you have a brain that is intact, that has the ability to acquire and, and to develop language, <clears throat> and the second and more, even to some extent, no less important, is to have the, uh, the, the, the sounds, to be an, env an environment where you hear the sounds, when you hear the, the words, when you hear the, the, the grammatical rules and the language spoken around you. So by that, that is going to feed into the, the, the brain and it will be what you hear, what you acquire, will be like the software that you will later use to again generate the language in your, on your own. So, um, but in the end, the, the individual has to be able to communicate and that person has to be able to receive and comprehend the messages that they interchange with the community. So communication disorders, first, communication is any method, anything at all that you use in order to, sh to, to send a message to someone else. <clears throat> that is communication. It doesn't matter if you are a human being, if you are an ant, if you are a bee, whatever it is. Species have languages among themselves, I mean communication systems among themselves. Human beings have many systems of communication. For example, one of them is sign language. One of them is body language and gestures. You can just go like this and the person is going to understand what you mean. Go like this or like this. And all these things are not spoken, but they are signed. They become a code that carries a message and that is communication. An ant might leave a trail for example, a chemical trail that is going to convey to other ants or communicate to other ants the location of food, the weight of that food. If, if the, a grain of sugar is big, how many ants will be needed to carry it? You know, how and so on. Where is it located and so on. Um, so communication is a general umbrella term for any means uh, that we use to give messages. And when I say message, 
it is anything that you want. If you're saying hi, that's a message in, in linguistics uh, or language. If you say, how are you? Um, if you give a sign, so all of these are messages. So language is one kind of communication that we use and it can be a manual language or sign language. It can be verbal language, for example. And verbal is the dominant because the majority of the population all over the world, they rely on spoken language. So, but generally when we look at also communication disorders, they also include hearing. If someone has a hearing disorder, um, that will make it difficult for them to hear uh, the messages that, that they people give to them. That is a communication disorder. So communication disorders include disorders of hearing, disorders of um, uh, language, disorders of speech. I'm going to distinguish among all of these. But generally, if you include people who have hearing disorders, speech disorders, and language disorders, they will be about 15% of the American population, for example. Back in 2015-2016, in um, um, the number of people with communication disabilities in the USA reached 46 million. At that time, the population was, was um, lower than now, I mean a few million uh, a few millions lower. Now it is um, American population 2019 is uh, 329 million. So, but in any case, in any given period of time, you are going to have about 15% of the American population generally would have disorders of communication that will affect one or more of these areas. So, when we speak about disorders of speech, in speech pathology terms, when you say someone has a speech disorder, it will mean one of three things. Number one, it can be a disorder of making the sounds, like we call it speech sound disorder. Difficulty formulating sounds, difficulty like saying the S as an F or saying the TH as a F. And all of us are more many we know familiar with these anyways. So disorder sound disorders or speech sound disorders, number one. And also under speech we have voice disorders. And under speech you also have fluency disorders, like stuttering, for example, is a fluency disorder. So speech disorders affect how you make speech. Okay, they affect how. They do not necessarily, yes, if they are severe, they will make it hard to hear the messages. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> they, the person will be, able to, will be able to acquire language, will have, you know, all the abilities, for example, that they have intellectual abilities and so on. Given, of course, that these disorders are only like speech and there is no other related problem that we know has caused it directly. So these are the, the, the disorders of speech. They have to do more with how you express. How do you give, how do you, you know, communicate verbally? And then language disorders have to do more with the content of the language, not how you say it. It is mainly the content of the language. What kind of message do you want to give? Do you want to say, um, ask a question? Do you want to answer a question? Do you want to uh, give directions? Do you want to um, tell a story? Um, what kind of grammar are you using? What kind of word do you select to, to, you know, to make your messages, to convey your messages? So language disorders or difficulties generally can, will have to do with receptive language abilities. That's the ability to to hear and comprehend language. And then expressive abilities, that is the ability to express your language, you, you know, to, to, to express yourself, not in speech, in writing or in, in language form. For example, you can send an, an email that is expressive language. 
you can't write an essay that is an uh, that is expressive language you so expressive language focuses on uh, what kind of words you select for what you want to say uh, the grammar what kind of grammatical rules how do you formulate your message and so on so again it has to do with the content of the language and when we say the content it means the meaning of that language and then hearing hearing there are different disorders of hearing i uh, generally we're going to speak about them later but generally they can be um, hearing problems because the person doesn't have um, for example you know the person has a hearing loss or that the person doesn't have a hearing loss but somehow when they hear the message it, even though their hearing is functional it goes to the brain something it comes as a different message so when i say to someone log and they say what dog what dog are you talking about a uh, chair I say what what do you want to share with me so they misunderstand uh, words they distort words even though when you test their hearing their hearing is perfectly normal so central hearing central auditory processing disorders they have to they are disorders that have to do with um, uh, difficulties that involve misunderstanding or distorting messages even though your hearing is functional. So now we look at um, communication disorders. What is a disorder <clears throat> and the kinds that are there. So a communication disorder um, basically is a some kind of a dysfunction in either getting the messages and under comprehending them or in conveying these messages i'm saying communication generally whether that is speech language hearing so it is an impairment that adversely affects communication it limits your ability to communicate messages uh, or to comprehend them it can be a communication disorder can be organic or functional or physiological is another term for functional so organic means that you can point to an organ that enables you to make speech and you say well um, this organ doesn't work as a result it cannot generate speech it cannot generate language let's say someone has a uh, for example uh, someone is born with um let's say um a deviated say for example um deviated larynx where let's say someone uh, is born with an abnormal larynx uh that person might have something that's called uh, stenosis where inside of the of the larynx below it uh, and inside in the lower part there is a narrowing and when that person speaks is gonna be speaking in a certain way uh, or is gonna have some growths that are like um, <clears throat> papillomas we call them that grow around the vocal folds and the areas around them and that's gonna make uh, it hard for them to make voice so that's called an organic disorder let's say someone um, has a polyp on the vocal fold or has a cyst or uh, something like you know something like that that's called organic so organic is because directly caused by an organ that is not uh, that is that is not working the way it should physiological or more more commonly you know professionals sometimes might say functional it has to do with the function because and ana we have anatomy and physiology another word for physiology is function so something a, a disorder might happen because the organ itself like say the tongue is is somehow is not um, uh, is not making it's not developed well it's not shaped well to make speech maybe the tongue is is tied down 
you know, to the, 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 the floor of the mouth, something that's called ankyloglossia. So <clears throat> that will have an effect on speech. So that's also an organic. So, but functional is a disorder that occurs despite the fact that the organs of speech are normal. They look normal. They behave, I mean, when you are not making speech, they behave normally. However, when you use them to make speech, they do not, they do not uh, function normally. So, functional, for example, is when you say someone has a speech sound problem, they have articulation problems. You do not know exactly directly why these problems are happening. You have no evidence. Everything is intact. The lips are fine. The tongue is fine. The vocal folds, this, this, that. But yet, there is a speech sound problem. So that we call this sometimes functional. It means it is not caused direct. I mean, it is not caused directly by a malformed or by a damaged uh, organ of speech. Developmental. Also, a problem can be developmental or it can be acquired. <clears throat> so, developmental, it mostly has to do with development. As you know, if you go to a field and just take some corn, you know, seeds of corn and just throw them in a field, they will grow, and when you look at each one of them, they will not exactly be the same height, the same thickness, the same this, this. They will be slightly different in how they grow. But at some point when they reach maturation, mostly they become, you know, uh, they, they catch up. So because of each one is in a different condition, each one has a different composition, this and that, the same way for development. Not all children are going to say the first word exactly, exactly by the, be, by the end of the 10th month or the beginning of the 11th month. Not all of them are going to say it exactly when they turn one year old. So there is a range. Some children say it at the beginning of the 11th month. Some children are going to say it when they are 14 months. Some might even be later. <coughs> so <coughs> children develop at different levels but there's an average so for example if a child doesn't develop for example the ability to make sentences when that child reaches 24 months of age when the child is two years old <clears throat> exactly 18 months to 24 or so months they should have they should be able to combine words to, to start to make sentences they might say mommy store <clears throat> uh, want toy want uh, bathroom something like that so they they combine words now if the child is three years old and cannot hasn't combined words yet then that is a delay when that there's a milestone where the average children are going to acquire that milestone and then the child, uh, one child doesn't develop within that range. Uh, children develop um, by, by uh, their first birthday, 12 months, they should have at least a single word in their vocabulary. They should be at least able to say the first word or they would have produced it by their first birthday. Now, a child who's 18 months or two and a half years doesn't say the first word. That is a, would be considered developmental delay. But after five years, then clearly it becomes, you know, it could be classified as a disorder, even though for insurance purposes and so on, uh, you, you have to, you, you, you classify these as disorders. Acquired is something that someone gets. So acquired means it is a disorder that comes, occurs because of a certain disease or a certain um, uh, circumstances that will cause 
a disruption of normal development or of, of what the person, of the abilities the person already has. So say someone is learning language and she acquires every, all the rules, she's able to talk, she's able, and she's seven years old, but then she falls off the top of the stairs and she, um, she has brain damage and then she starts to have a speech problem uh, or maybe a, a hearing problem or whatever, you know, damage that, that can cause speech or language or hearing difficulties. So in that case, we call that acquired. And it, it, typically it is caused by something else, even though uh, development is normal and things are uh, going on okay. Like someone having a stroke, you know, that person, something, and a disease or something happens and it disrupts their ability to communicate. We also have a communication difference and uh, communication differences primarily have to do with, you know, people speaking another language or another dialect, for example. In the same language, like in English, there are nine regional, big, big regional dialects that follow the immigration routes from the 1600s when Europeans, you know, settlers came and started to, to, to spread in, um, uh, inward and south and, and um, north and south and, and west. They followed nine famous routes of immigration. And along these routes, like Ohio, the Midwest, and so on, they developed, people settled there from different uh, particular communities in England or in Germany or in Italy and so on, and they developed a certain accent. <clears throat> in the South, uh, many, many people would come from a specific or more specific areas in, in England and, you know, Virginia colonies and so on, and they developed the Southern accent. So, in the North, so the, there are within the same language, there are regional variations. Like, for example, um, the Boston, what is known as the Boston accent. Uh, sometimes you might say, someone might say Cape Cod, someone might say Cape Cod. So, in any case, um, so in short, a communication difference is a difference that results, uh, I mean, is, is a difficulty or a communication um, uh, or a difference in the way that people communicate because the English, for example, is not their native language. And if someone, an English speaking person goes to Germany or goes to China and that person begins to learn the language there, they will speak it with an accent or to various degrees. Um, that accent is not a disorder, it is a difference. So the goal is if the person is able to convey messages to be comprehended by others and they are able to receive and comprehend messages that others give them. The difference is in the way you say the words and the way that, um, that are related to the effect of a, a native language, or different language, that is not a disorder. So in speech language pathology, um, yes, there is, there are professionals in speech language pathology who work uh, with accent modification, and that is a part of our field. However, that is optional. That is a matter of choice. Um, with a person comes to you and says, for example, I am a CAO of a company and I'm from China and I am coming here to work in the USA to facilitate my business, but my language is not strong enough. Uh, when I speak, even though I know many words and sentences and so on, when I speak, uh, my language is not very clear to others. I want to improve my accent. So that way, that is a matter of choice, but it is never a disorder. There are situations, of course, when someone 
uh, who speaks another language, whose native language is not English, uh, and also would have a disorder, a language or a communication disorder. <clears throat> but for that to be labeled a disorder, it has to exist in both languages. So if someone has a say a language disorder, you want to know, is it a language difference or is it a language disorder? You have to test them in both languages and to determine if the problem exists in both languages, then that is, is a language disorder in the native language and also in the second language. Um, so uh, it is valuable for you as a speech language pathologist to know a second language. When you are bilingual, for example, knowing speech, uh, knowing Spanish or Portuguese or Arabic or you know, any language that has a significant population in the USA uh, that may come from different um, countries, then you will become an asset to that community and you also will become a person in demand when they, people seek you. And in the American Speech Language Hearing Association website, there is a place where uh, bilingual speech language pathologists are listed and, and um, the public can, can go there and look for a specialist in their area, for example. So that's it about communication differences, a communication difference versus a communication disorder. Um, so again, that's what, what I just explained. Um, and speech language pathologists, they do not treat language differences. However, they provide support to people who volitionally, who optionally, uh, you know, seek it to improve their accent. They, as speech pathologists, will be the best qualified to provide that accent modification. Now we're going to go over some terminology that is from the World Health Organization. For example, what are the differences among impairment, disability, and handicap? An impairment is a loss of um, phys physiological, I mean psychological, uh, physiological, anatomic, um, or functional. Um, for example, ability. So, for example, someone might have a depression. That's an impairment because it affects how they communicate with others. Uh, physiological. Uh, someone might have a voice disorder. Um, that uh, you know, for example, the organs uh, that produce uh, voice are not functioning normally. For example, someone might have an anatomical uh, problem that will cause them not to develop language in a certain way. Like someone, for example, having hydrocephalus and the brain born with hydrocephalus, like in the brain, there are ventricles or spaces that are filled with fluid. Every one of us has that. But in some cases, the, the, these ventricles are so large and there's so much fluid in there that puts pressure on other areas of the brain and these other areas do not develop and they are not functioning normally. So that is anatomic, for example. So any loss or abnormality of psychological, physiological, or anatomical uh, structure or function, that is an impairment. A disability has to do more with how do you compare with members of the community in terms of how you go about your daily life. It is more of the effect of the impairment on your daily living. So it's the uh, reduced level of competence in doing what you, what other people can do in their day. A handicap is more of the consequence or the effect of an impairment or disability um, in one way or another. For example, someone has a voice disorder that is gonna give, make, that will be, be a handicap. It will limit their ability to have a good job. It will limit their ability to communicate with people in this way and that way. So the handicap is a social, educational, or occupational disadvantage that results 
from an impairment or a disability. And the term handicap um, I mean, is, an, is, is an old term. Um, I wish it could change, it could be changed, but anyways. Um, so that is the effect of either an impairment or a disability. What do you mean by saying person first language? This doesn't have to do with native language or, or second language. Notice the hyphen in between person first language. In other words, um, terminology is important. Instead of saying, for example, you, you would hear in the past, at least maybe even now, some people say um, autistic uh, individual or, uh, you know, I, I, I work with autistic children. That is not appropriate. Some people say, um, I, uh, for example, uh, work with uh, manic depressive patients. So, you know, kind of linguists will tell you that when you say, for example, autistic child, you're making the disability define the, in, the whole entire individual. And even though the disability is only part of that individual, so it has more judgment. You are coloring the entire, you are only seeing in that person, you are only seeing their disability. However, when you say the correct way, when you say the person with autism, for example, the person with ADHD or the individual with language disorder, that is better because the individual is not the entire disorder. The, the, the disorder is only one aspect that is affecting the life of the whole individual. So, in other words, in short, uh, politically and ethically, it is better to, to say the person with or the person who has. So, the person with autism, and the person with Down syndrome, the person or the individual with language disorder as opposed to uh, say autistic child or ADHD child or um, you know language disorders child. Additional terminology in terms of congenital what congenital means is that it's a condition that is present at birth for example CP is, is you know children are born with it uh, when a child is born with uh, 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 ankyloglossia, where the tongue uh, is stuck to the floor of the mouth, and the, 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 the tips of the tongue become like clover leaves, they grow this way and that way, and the tongue grows abnormally. That is called an ankyloglossia. The child is born with it, and what they do is, at some point, uh, you know, there are surgeries that clip the attachment of the tongue that, that makes it attached to the floor. It's called uh, phrenectomy. So, um, acquired is a, a disorder that the person gets after developing the communication abilities. However, the acquired disorder will disrupt their ability to communicate, like someone having dementia, someone having traumatic brain injury, uh, or a stroke. Organic, it, it, it refers more to the organ that is causing the problem, like say cleft palate. Uh, cleft palate is caused by uh, the, the, the velum or the palate that separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. It's like this. And when you say any sound other than na na nasal sounds, the velum goes up like this, and the air goes to the mouth. So you say, ah, ah, that will be up. If you say, mmm, the velum goes down. However, um, some people have, uh, the velum is split. We call it cleft or split. The, the cleave is to split. And cleft is a past tense form of cleave. So it's like saying um, split peas, for example. But this one is cleft, and then it is taken also as a noun to, to refer to um, you know, cleft palate. 
Uh, sometimes you say the cleft is big or small. So the cleft palate is, you know, a, an abnormality that's causing the palate not to close normally, not to, you know, so it is split and it causes air to go into the nasal cavity. It has a lot of other issues that are associated with it, but that is an organic problem because the, the soft palate, uh, the soft palate or velum is a, an organ and it is split and that is an organic disorder. It's a physical uh, cause for a disorder. Functional um, is means physiological. It means it has to do with how the organ functions. And uh, for example, again, the, the palate might be functional. It can go up and down. However, for you know maybe some people, it might be sluggish. It is not going up and, and acting fast and extending as it should, even though it is completely intact. So functional, um, you describe a disorder as functional when you do not have a clear abnormality in the anatomy uh, of a structure. Uh, it could be sometimes developmental delays. For example, uh, when someone has a speech sound problem, you say, well, uh, there's nothing clear that is causing it. So it is a result of uh, the performance um, not of abnormality in the structure. Our communication disorders, speech or language, these are, or social communication, these are disorders, believe it or not, they are classified as mental disorders. Uh, mental disorders are all listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders by the American Psychiatric Association. And the last edition is the 19, uh, I mean the 2013 edition, uh, which is the fifth edition. It's called DSM-5. So if you get DSM-5, you're going to find the communication disorders listed there. Why do we list them as mental? That is because everything we do is based in the brain. All these problems are happening originally because there's some way or another, the brain is the source of them. So we have uh, articulation disorder. This, one, by the way, is not called articulation and phonological disorder. Uh, we have one disorder called speech sound disorder. But this is just a general term, uh, especially, you know, um, so, speech problems exist in about 10% of children, not everyone. They exist in 10% of kids. Fluency disorders, the most common one is stuttering. There's another disorder that's not yet classified officially. It's called cluttering, and that is different. Um, we'll be speaking about that when we speak about fluency disorders. Um, so it is an unusual interruption in the flow of speaking and um, if you speak about incidents like what is the risk of someone developing um, uh, stuttering disorder for example so you have about five percent you know risk incidence uh, how many people actually have uh, fluency how many people actually stutter say in the world or in the United States. It is 1% of the population. So prevalence has to do with the actual number of cases that exist in a given period uh, of time. Voice disorders, they, they exist between three to 9% of the population in the United States. Um, for example, uh, they have to do with either uh, problems resulting from the vocal folds like we call that phonation problems. The vocal folds phonate, they make a voice, they make a sound. And then they also, voice disorders can also be resonance, not having to do with the vocal folds, but they have to do with how the air is, trans, uh, is transmitted through the oral cavity and the nasal cavity and how 
that air circulates and how it is uh, it vibrates to repeat the sound that the vocal folds make so that is resonance like in other words someone speaks like this they become more nasal and then it becomes the velum goes down and the air goes through their noses so that's called hyper nasality or someone might speak like hyponasality. I am not good at, at mimicking hyponasality, but it, it only affects nasal sounds. You don't have enough air going into the nasal cavity when you make mm, mm, mm sounds. So the person sounds like they have a cold. So the word say mom, mom. Now you clearly understand mom. Someone is calling his mother or her mother. But when you have a cold, it might come like this, Bob, Bob. So mom becomes Bob. So it will be more if not enough air goes out when you say the nasal sounds. So these are resonance problems. They do not have anything to do with the vocal folds. So now we speak about the types of language disorders. Language, there are language delays, for example, when the child reaches two years of age, that child should have at least about 400 words. So that child will be able to combine words to make sentences. But children who are two years of, old, of age, and they only, they have 50 words or less, then, and they do not combine words to make sentences, there is no way, that's a language delay because the milestone at the two years of age is to is to make sentences it doesn't matter how big or small but to combine words to make sentences that is a milestone that's achieved by two years of age if the child doesn't have that milestone around that time then that's a language delay generally children 50 percent of the children catch up you know, they, they, they do better and they catch up with other kids by age five years. And by age 10 or 11 years, basically between age 11 and 12, I'm sorry, 11 and 12, language becomes similar to that of the adult. So by the end of, you could say, fifth grade, the language of a fifth grader is, is similar to that of an adult and then we have developmental language disorders these are um, they, they result uh, when the child is developing language and then the disorders occurs that the child is not you know that the, the child has reached a certain age when we say we can't say they are delayed no it is beyond that the, the, uh, the milestone, for example, a child is supposed to have a, uh, a, a word by age one year, and now it is four years or five years, they are not speaking, then there's a problem there. So uh, a developmental language disorder is a disorder that begins from birth, and I mean, uh, it begins in childhood, and it prevents or interferes with, or it is... In fact, evidence that the child is not developing language normally. So it doesn't occur later. No, the child is in the process of developing language, but you know, even though it is not a language delay, the child is still struggling and still has not yet acquired all the rules and all um, the, the, the skills of speech and language. So 6 to 8% of all children have a developmental language disorder. Uh, for example, developmental disorders generally include attention deficit. For example, the child is born and at some point they will show that they have attention deficit. Uh, uh, autism, uh, the child is born and at some point the child will show evidence that he or she has autism. So that's also a developmental disorder. So when we speak about developmental language disorders, it is the child is born, continue, you know, starts to learn the language, and then at some point they show they cannot learn it at the normal rate and the normal quantity um, 
you know, and you have shown that um, after a long time and you can't consider it a delay, then it becomes a disorder. So that includes children with mental retardation, autism, specific language impairment, dyslexia. Well, not, so these are different disorders. However, a language, a developmental language disorder or a disorder, language disorder is it exists with mental retardation. It exists with autism. It exists with specific language impairment and, and also dyslexia. So in other words, um, this language, I'm sorry, uh, mental retardation, autism, um, and dyslexia, the, especially mental retardation, autism, they, in some cases, they are the cause of the language problem, but we still describe their language deficiencies as a language disorder, even though you could classify it as a secondary language disorder because it is, we know it is caused by the mental retardation or by the autism or by the Down syndrome. When you speak about specific language impairment, that is language impairment that has no associated cause that is known to, to cause it or to be the source of it. That is specific language impairment. But if it is someone has mental retardation, someone has autism, we do not call that specific language impairment. Acquired language disorders, they result from brain damage directly to the brain, whether by traumatic brain damage like an accident or by a cerebrovascular event like a stroke, for example. So, uh, for example, aphasia um, is language loss, so language impairment that is caused by some kind of a, a stroke or some kind of a, a abnormality affecting, especially stroke affecting. Uh, the cerebral um, circulation of blood. Uh, this also we have progressive degeneration uh, that can cause um, one, one uh, form or another of degeneration of the areas that um, you know affect language and emotions and so on. Two million Americans have it. That is basically the dementias. Uh, one form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> so these two are, are basically one group. Parkinson's disease is a disease that where the person, you know, shakes, that is tremors, and uh, also that will affect the joints and the face and the ability to, to contract the muscles of your face to express yourself at some point the the patient has difficulty removing the muscles of the face and they have what is known as mask face when they don't can't show expressions on their face. Uh, their voice is affected and the way they speak is, is affected. Um, so two million Americans, maybe a little bit more now uh, with the increased population, they have a progressive dementia degeneration or kind of, which means um, the brain just begins to decline no matter what you do. Hearing disorders um, affect uh, hearing, how you can hear sounds, so they affect acuity of, of your hearing. Um, there are roughly uh, between 28 million and uh, 30 million Americans now with hearing uh, disorders, and uh, hearing disorders are described based on the level of severity or the degree of hearing disorders. So a hearing disorder can be mild, it can be moderate, it can be severe, profound, uh, I mean, or generally or profound. Um, let me show you. This is the decibel scale that the, the, the audiologists use. They put on, on a chart called the audiogram. When you go to have your hearing checked, uh, have an audiological evaluation, this is what they write the results on. It is the, the inverted decibel scale. So the decibel scale has um, uh, 130 steps. So zero means perfect hearing. That is zero. If someone hears at minus, zero, minus 5, minus 10, 
that is like really above normal and that's rare in the population it is not always good to have like super hearing so uh, then hearing is like saying when say for example a leaf an oak leaf drops you should be able to hear it it's going to make a sound that is five decibels five is here it's going to make a sound that's uh, five decibels so you should be able to hear it here so that shows you for example going down how loud do you need the sound to be so you can hear it as you go down and this is the pitch of the sound as you as you hear it so that leaf the normal uh, normal hearing the person it could be five decibel the person just hears it the leaf falling and hitting the ground then but if someone doesn't hear it we say get a microphone put put it next to the leaf as it falls 10 decibel the person uh, maybe the person will hear it if you mag um, amplify that you know put that microphone next to that and make it 10 decibel the person can hear it that is normal too but 15 raise it by 15 the person will hear it that is also normal but what if you the person doesn't hear it until you crank it to 20 decibel then that at that point you say well the person has a hearing loss that is mild so in some states the regulations say 15 if you cannot hear something until it comes to 15 decibel here then that means that is a, the beginning of a hearing loss and you describe mild hearing loss from 15 decibel to 40 but the majority of the states go and say well until you know from zero or from minus 10 to 20 that is all normal you can if you can you know your hearing is here that is fine that is normal but once it, it gets into 20 or 20 30 40 that is will be mild hearing loss and then you need to do something about it and then 40 to 40 to 60 that is called moderate actually 40 uh, to 70 decibel that is moderate that is like the person cannot really function without a hearing aid that is moderate the blue area and then 70 to 90 that is severe they will just they can hear the sound only when it becomes so loud so loud but profound <clears throat> which is basically this anacusis um, that means lack of hearing profound basically means th th there is no hearing you know they can feel the vibration the sound becomes so loud like someone outside in, in a car and playing the music so loudly that you in your house you feel the house is shaking and you can hear feel the vibration with your feet then the person here feels these vibrations they can they they would would detect the sound this way but they will not be able to hear anything so these are the levels of hearing uh, loss um, and each one has its own limitations for example someone with a mild hearing uh, problem can hear all vowels and most consonants spoken at conversational loudness level however they need um, they, they need to be closer to the source they need to adjust themselves and come close they might need to ask you a couple of what 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 uh, but they can get by the moderate they cannot without a hearing aid difficult it's difficult to hear unstressed words and word endings like i say cats you hear it as cat uh, bugs you hear it as bug uh, books the s's th's and you know certain sounds at the end of forward you cannot really detect and and again severe is they, they just can hear environmental sounds but they cannot hear uh, much of uh, speech and the profound is definitely just very very uh, severe problem and then anacusic anacusis means lack of hearing so now we look at 
we looked at the levels or the severity of hearing loss, but we want to look at the kinds of hearing loss that we will have. Someone might have a conductive hearing loss. Conductive, it has to do with the conduction of the signal from outside until it reaches the cochlea, the inner ear. Suppose someone has, the, you know, the, the pinna is cut. They don't have a, a functional, you know, outer, the pinna. Or maybe the ear canal uh, is blocked with wax, or maybe it is very narrow. Or maybe the eardrum has a hole in it. Or maybe the bones in the middle ear are damaged. All of this is called, uh, all of these are part of the outer ear, middle ear. If these problems exist, they will cause what is known as a conductive hearing loss. So conductive hearing loss is a hearing loss that is caused by a physical problem in the outer ear or middle ear. There's fluid in the middle ear, the middle ear infection. So conductive hearing losses are reversible. You can cure them. You can get the functioning normal again. But sensory neural hearing losses are not reversible. They are permanent. They result from the damage to the cochlea, to the inner ear, or damage to the auditory nerve um, that, is, that is sensory neural. And in some cases, some people might have both. They have sensory neural permanent hearing loss, and they also have temporary hearing loss. As someone who has a, uh, say, uh, um, uh, dysfunctional cochlea, or they have a, a mild or a moderate hearing loss that is sensory neural, they also might have fluid in the middle ear. They might also have wax in the middle and the ear canal. So someone might have both, and that is called mixed hearing loss. And also we speak about, is the hearing loss in, in one ear or both ears? Monaural is in, the, say, in one ear, and then bilateral is both ears. So monaural or, uni, or unilateral, and then bilateral is, um, is both ears. <coughs> Okay, now we switch gears to talk about the disciplines, about the professions. Uh, we speak about speech and hearing science. Uh, we speak about uh, speech language pathology. And we speak about audiology. These are three professions that are or undergrad programs of speech language or, or communication sciences and disorders qualify you to join to 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 go to so you can go to you know study communication sciences and disorders to be a speech language scientist you might decide to go become a speech language pathologist you might decide to go to become an audiologist all of these again uh, the undergrad programs will enable you to to um, enroll in. So the discipline, speech language pathology, um, basically we focus on the study of, communica of communication differences and disorders, more focused on disorders. The study of also the efficacy of practices that are involved in evaluating or um, assisting individuals who have communication differences or communication disorders. Uh, this, so these are the three professions that I just mentioned, that communication sciences and disorders programs, the undergrad, they will help you to apply to. For speech language and hearing scientists, uh, basically, they have the same preparation, and also, basically, also audiology uh, people who seek uh, audiology you can you can have go to uh, communication sciences and disorders undergrad program, and you can apply to become an audiologist as well. So, the speech, language, and hearing scientists they can have the same preparation like you do for other the two other areas. 
they conduct the research and investigate the anatomic structures, physiological functioning, uh, and the perception um, that enables us to develop communication skills, what happens in the brain, for example. Uh, they study the muscle function of muscles and the activity of muscles, uh, and they try to find the, the, you know, see how the brain areas um, behave in order to make language possible. Uh, they, for example, uh, study how children um, develop language or speech abilities. Uh, they study the anatomy and physiology um, you know, of language, the neurobiology of language, and what, what happens to cause a disability of communication. So it's research, basically. The speech-language pathology is sometimes called the SLP. Um, in the beginning, 1920s, they would call them speech therapists and then later speech correctionists. And then in 1976, they started to call us pathologists because pathology is the, the, the field of identifying disease and we deal with the diseases or the you know that are associated with communication and um, a pathologist also uh, diagnoses or provides a diagnosis for that problem that someone has and they prescribe the best ways to treat that problem comes from pathos or pathos which means disease in in latin So it's more medical, in other words. And, and speech pathology is a medical field, by the way. So a speech-language pathologist provides diagnostics or evaluations and rehabilitation services to the patients from birth to old age. All age, from the minute they are born, you might find a speech-language pathologist working with that person. You know, if they have a cleft palate or if they have... Uh, some kind of, you know, swallow feeding uh, abnormality a problem. They go and work with them from the beginning. They train the parent on how to, to feed the, the, the newborn and how to enable the newborn to, to survive and so on. Speech pathologists work in different, many, many settings. Um, for example, they work in hospitals, they work in schools, they work in rehab centers, they work for companies that produce, uh, uh, produce resources and clinical materials, they work with the government, they work with insurance companies, they work in private practice. There's a lot of demand for speech on speech language pathologists and uh, there's, it's not difficult to find a job nowadays. So the academic preparation Number one, the student has to have a, a major in communication sciences and disorders or a minor in communication sciences and disorders. Uh, the minor, for example, uh, for most places will be um, the intro to language disorders that you are taking now. Um, language acquisition and development, phonetics, anatomy and physiology, of speech, language, and hearing, uh, speech and hearing science. Uh, some programs require, uh, I mean, uh, and also audiology, and some programs, grad programs, also require neurological basis of speech, language, and hearing. So the six courses that most, that, that basically are required to join any grad program in the country, but some programs require neurological basis uh, and some might not. So, but the, that is for the minor. The major, you, you study more classes, but in any case, with a bachelor's degree in communication sciences and disorders, or a minor in communication sciences and disorders, you will be eligible to apply to grad school in speech, language, pathology, in audiology or to become a speech language scientist. Once you apply, 
you go to the grad program if you the grad programs are very competitive and they require the, the minimum requirement to go to a grad program to apply is 3.0 however be careful about this so when you sample when you survey the people who are actually accepted in a communication sciences and disorders program people who apply and get accepted i mean just those who actually get accepted the gpa that is being accepted nationally exceeds 3.5 it doesn't mean that you do not apply if your gpa is less no it means the average some programs might accept at 3.3 some might accept at 3.6 or 7 so but the average is 3.5 that is actually being accepted and again the minimum required for you to apply is 3.0 so please do not misunderstand that um, and the reason is uh, these programs are very competitive and they look for the best students they have many many students apply and 20 percent of whoever applies gets accepted out of 100 you get 20. so you know when you um, look into speech language pathology if that is your passion take it seriously and and get your grades um, really up there so you will have a better chance of being accepted So um, the scope of, and also, once you apply to a grad program, you get accepted, um, you complete the academic coursework, and most programs uh, give you, um, require 55 graduate credits, and you complete 25 hours of observation before you begin to do um, actual treatment and diagnostics then you complete um, you complete 375 hours in direct uh, work with patients you do diagnostics you do treatment under the supervision of a certified speech language pathologist most programs in the country they help you uh, in the clinic they they start with you give you a number of hours in the clinic when you are supervised by professors or by clinical supervisors and then they they help you and they place you with hospitals and with schools and they help you get this 375 hours so in the end you have practicum hours of 400 again that includes the 27 27 hours of observation combined with the 20 with the 375 hours of direct um, services uh, treatment and diagnostics so the scope of practice is like what are our limits where do we what do we do uh, as specialists speech language pathologists focus on the diagnosis and treatment of speech problems of you know for example our speech sound disorders uh, disfluency uh, or voice disorders language disorders receptive difficulties expressive difficulties or social communication swallowing and feeding disorders called dysphagia these are there's also cognitive communication disorders also the speech language pathologist works on the audiologist so back again once you graduate from a speech language pathology program you are going to spend one year which is nine months working under the supervision now you are out and working yeah, with a master's degree and you work for nine months which is considered one year um, and then you get a certificate of clinical competence ccc like in my email when i or my my title whatever i say ahmed m abdel al speech language um, pathologist or slp and then dash c c c means certificate of clinical competence that means that is certification by the american speech language hearing association with that certification then you will be able to get your licensure also 
from the board of licensure in your state that board certifies any profession in the in the state like physicians plumbers and so on but the requirement minimum requirement to become an slp is a master's degree the minimum requirement to become an audiologist is a doctorate in audiology so you have the same qualifications here and, and the same requirements however you do your work in audiology and you get your three seven you know your hours of practicum in audiology and also um you you the the, the degree itself is built most places build in a five-year program that has a master's and a doctorate together but the minimum requirement for you to become an audiologist is a doctorate um doctor uh, speech language pathologists work in the school system as a matter of fact the majority the overwhelming majority of us work in the school system uh, however um the 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 audiologist doesn't work in the school system the audiologist typically works in a hospital or in a private practice so in other words there are less audiologists out there than speech language pathologists the the organization we follow is called the american speech language hearing association and that includes audiologists and speech language pathologists and speech language hearing scientists uh, the, the association provides uh, you know uh, regulations for establishing academic programs in speech language pathology or audiology uh, it um, it regulates uh, the requirements for the field, the the ethics. Uh, it, it basically it, it is the it is the official uh, body that enables speech language pathology programs to exist and to function. And they put regulations and they work with the governments on our behalf and so on. So there's also within that the American Academy of Audiology that uh, that kind of uh, you know also takes care of the particular um you know things that have to do with audiologists uh, the asha certificate of clinical competence that's again as i mentioned is a, a nine months as a year but it's nine months typically a school year can do it or just nine months and it, to, to uh, get it you have to have a master's degree or you, if you become an audiologist, you have to have an AUD audiology doctorate. Uh, you have to have this clinical, ex, the clinical experience of 375 hours. And also after you start to perform on your own and have a job on your own, you have to continue to maintain your licensure by taking, um, going to conferences and get a graduate credit year by year so you can stay current in your field and there's also the american board of audiology that they are responsible for cert certification of uh, audiologists licensure is uh, a situation that you deal with with the state whatever grad program you graduate from is going to help you uh, get your license by uh, also getting the ASHA certification, all this sending it to the Board of Licensure, and then they will um, basically, if you are ASHA, if you have your credentials uh, go working well, and and you know they um, you can get the licensure first. They give you a provisional license to practice, and then once you get the ASHA, they give you a, a, your permanent license. You renew it every couple of years. They also require. Uh, that you maintain um, graduate uh, credits uh, by attending um, <clears throat> conferences and taking courses and so on. We have a we have a, a code of ethics that is very um, very protected by the organization by the association, and the basically highlights is to focus on the, the the welfare of the patient that we are servicing or the client we are working with that's a priority and to honor our responsibility to achieve and maintain the highest level of professional competence that we have to be skilled and know what we are doing 
and also to promote the public interest and understanding of the professions of speech, language, and hearing, and audiology, and so on, to make people aware of these professions and what they provide and what we do, and also to support the development of services that are designed to fulfill the unmet needs of the public. Like, for example, you know, there are people are not getting enough audiology services or enough speech language services we need to ensure that we have enough um, professionals to provide these services and so on uh, and this again now in conclusion we went over um, the difference between communication and language uh, the different you know speech and language problems we went we discussed um, um, certification and licensure we discussed uh, what it means to to not to describe a person in terms of his or her disability but rather to describe to uh, you know say for example a person with so this way that disability does not define the individual uh, we spoke about the professions of speech language uh, pathology audiology and speech language scientists and what they do uh, we spoke about uh, the concepts con congenital disorder versus acquired, organic disorders versus functional. We spoke about impaired impairment versus disability and handicap, and also the disorders of hearing, speech, language, and language. So this uh, brings to conclusion our first um, um, lecture and um, i hope that you found it helpful i hope that it has clarified a lot of the the concepts that you you studied in the chapter and please um, i welcome your questions thank you